You look pretty good today. I mean, way, way better than normal, so that's good. Um, I, I just want to echo what Nathan already mentioned. I am so proud of John and Tyler and Bailey. Give it up for our school and ministry graduates one more time. And of course, all you graduates from high school and college, I'm proud of you as well. And uh, listen, we, it's really a perfect segue into what we're talking about today because we're, we're wrapping up our family series today. And uh, how many of y'all, any of y'all enjoyed that? Maybe a couple of y'all, a few of you, yeah. Go, yeah, that's right. There's people in the back. Um, you know, if you missed any of that, or even better yet, you just want to go and uh, recap some of those topics, you can go to our YouTube channel. And uh, we do have our own YouTube channel now. We have, you know, we have 18 locations of this church, so make sure you go to ours. I think about half of us have YouTube channels. So make sure you go to this one. It's New Life Church. Heber Springs is where you're at, all right? So just, it's pretty simple. Just find it and, uh, and go check it out. Um, but uh, we've talked about marriage. Uh, when I started the series, I just talked about fighting for your family, just that whole topic. Um, and then we talked about church family some. We talked about singleness. And, uh, and then today, we're, we're going to talk about parenting. Oh, yeah, you sound excited. Uh, first off, let me just say this. Let me just right out the gate. Y'all look at me when I say this. You will never be the perfect parent. Can I? Somebody's excited about that. So just take that off the board, okay? I mean, you know, I, I know that in all, all areas of our life, I think you would agree, we need God's grace, okay? But I'm just going to say this, that I think that this area we're talking about today is probably one of those that we need a whole lot of His grace. Can I get an amen? amen. Parents, amen. amen. Kids, amen. <laughs> a couple of them are like, yeah, yeah, my parents need a lot of grace. So, uh, Again, there's no perfect parents. There's no perfect family. I, I taught you guys this earlier. Uh, but you know what there are? There are godly families. There are healthy families. But here's the thing. It takes work to have that. It takes intentionality. A healthy family just doesn't happen just because you have that, right? And it also takes a certain amount of cooperation with the other family members, <laughs> Kind of like a team. You know, this is a team sport here. And uh, here's something that I, I want to encourage everybody in here. Look at me, y'all. It is never too late. This topic, you might feel like it's too late. I'm telling you it's not. Uh, hey, grandparents in the room. I was talking to a family that goes to our church a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I love this. I'm so proud of them. These guys, they told me that now they have a weekly family time or even Bible study every week. Uh, and they have their, their grown kids with them, and then some of their grandkids get to participate. But they told me, look, it did not start that way in their family. It took a lot of hard work. And they're there as grandparents. How cool is that, though? I think that's wonderful. And here's the most important thing you need to know before we get into the Scripture. Yes, it takes hard work, but what, what you need more than anything is the Spirit of God helping you. Amen? You need the Spirit of God helping you. And look at this, look at this passage in Psalm 127. It's such a great scripture. I've never put the two concepts I'm about to show you in this scripture. I've never put them together until this week. But look at this. It's uh, verses one through five. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Remember, we just said you need the spirit of God's help, right? Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. Okay, so he's talking about work there, not staying up late playing video games or like, you know, Netflix or whatever. He's saying, he's talking about being stressed out, working, worried, all this stuff, okay? Y'all get that? He says, in vain you're doing all that, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Yes, amen for sleep. And then look how it immediately goes to this topic. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. I'm not sure what that says about children born in your old age. We won't go there. I don't know what that means, okay? But look at this. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. This is great. This psalm, it's, it's really interesting because as I was researching it, it had two main audiences, and, and, and one audience is parents, right? Israelite families, this was to the parents, okay? This psalm. But also it was to the larger community of Israel. And that's because, first off, this psalm was read 
at the birth of every Jewish child. But it was also a song that pilgrims would recite as they would ascend on their way to Jerusalem on their yearly pilgrimage together as the people of God. And I think that's because God has mainly two gardens that he grows kids in. One of them is your home, the other is the church. And this is what he does, and they work in tandem. And the psalm, here's the big point, though. The psalm says the children are a gift. Not a lot of amens there. I don't know what happened. (laughs) Some of you will like this one. It also says they're a weapon. (laughs) You know that. they're, They're like arrows, which are weapons. And you know, arrows, they're not meant to stay in the quiver. So you can say the purpose of parenting Listen, you're preparing your children, right? And so, so the purpose of parenting is to release those children into this world as a weapon, as a weapon for the Lord. And uh, so, you know, I, I have four weapons and uh, four arrows. Some of you have one or two. Some of y'all have so many, we really don't even know the number that you have. I mean, you just have a lot of arrows. And, uh, but there are couples in our church right now that they, that they want to be parents, but for whatever reason, they can't. Our prayer for you is that God would give you the desires of your heart, just like he promised in his word. But basically, this verse is saying that our kids, kids are not liabilities. Your kids are assets. And, and, and they have a purpose in the world. And so we, we are the warriors that this scripture is talking about. And we, we only have these children in our quivers, if you will, under our care under our training for a short while. And then the idea is you let them fly. Yes, yeah, some parent got real happy about that. You, yeah, you let them fly, man. This is the purpose, amen? This is what we're doing. This is, as parents, this is the role, okay? So I wanna talk to you about some biblical principles of parenting. And, uh, and I also wanna give you a big disclaimer right up front. Y'all look at me, I'm not an expert. The Bible is. And I'll also say this, there, there are men in here that are better dads than I am, and I learn from you. And I think all of us should. Parents, man, look around. We've got some great ones here. And so, so speaking of parenting and just you know, principles around parenting, i got to tell you a story about one of my kids, Nathan. And, uh, of course, he's grown now, but when, when he was, I think it was about five, Kamani and I were trying to figure this out, about five years old, uh, we were, our family was there in Coles. Y'all, y'all are familiar with this store? And so um, Nathan, again, about five years old, he kind of got away from us a little bit. You know, kind of, I kind of see where he's at. He's over by the bedding. You know how they have that fake bed and they display all their bedspreads and all this? Okay, so I see out of the corner of my eye, I guess it was like his nap time or something. He just crawls right up into that fake bed, pulls back the covers, lays his head on the, on the pillow and just kind of curls up in the fetal position and takes a nap. I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> but then what wasn't so awesome, I kind of see also out the corner of my eye an employee heading his direction, you know? And so, so, so let me tell you the best parenting principle ever. You ready? Just walk the other way. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> and I sent somebody else to go get him. I think it was Bailey Woodson, actually. Yes, it was. And she used to help us with our kids a lot. And so, so, so uh, anyway, um, by the way, I got, I got an update on this story. He actually works in that same store right now. So get you some of that right there. All right, y'all ready for some helpful principles now? These are some good, these are, now here's some biblical principles. Uh, write, write this one down. Number one, pray for them. Pray for your children. Come on, Christ followers in here. You are called to pray for your children. Remember, we just read that unless the Lord builds the house, nothing you do is going to work. Unless the Lord is in it, then, then, then nothing's going to work. And so, parents, you have got to have the Holy Spirit's help on this. And, and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this point just simply to say this. Uh, Kamani and I, we, we pray for our, our four boys and but the two things that I pray for most for, for my kids has always been this. Uh, number one, first prayer is this, 
that they would love the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Like, in other words, not a religion type of situation. I'm talking about a real relationship with Jesus. And if their hearts wander from him, that he would pull them back to himself by the power of his Holy Spirit. That they would know him, they would love him, okay? That's the first thing I pray. And then I pray this a lot as well, that they would always walk in the purpose that Jesus has for them on this earth. Man, what is better than that, parents? I mean, if your kids are doing that, is that that's pretty much the, the end, right? That's it. That's the goal. And I'm going to say this. If you ace this principle about praying for your kids, I mean, the other ones are important. But even if you, if you mess up everything else, I'm going to say, if you ace just this one, I'm telling you, you're ahead of the game. Because you will have the Lord on your side. He's going to be answering prayer, okay? In fact, can we pray for your kids right now? Can you think about your children right now? Let's pray. Lord, we just pray that prayer right now for our children. God, we just pray that they would know you. They would love you with all and everything they have, God. And I just pray that if they ever wander from you, the children of this church, God, all the children, God, would just run back to you instead of running away from you. And God, we pray that our children will walk in your purpose for them all the days of their life. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right. Number two, teach them constantly. Right? This is what the quiver is about. They're here to be trained. Teach them constantly. And we as parents, y'all look at me, we have to take the responsibility. We have to own this thing for teaching our children the truth. It's on me, okay? It's on you as a parent. Teaching them the Bible, teaching them the Bible's principles, teaching them how to honor authority, teaching them about the birds and the bees. People still call it that, I guess, right? I don't even know. Um, some of y'all don't know what that is, so I guess they don't. Uh, here's what I'm telling you, though. We cannot blame our culture. We can't blame the schools. We can't blame the church. Listen, raising our children in the truth is our parents. Parents, I'm talking to parents. It's our responsibility. And uh, it's our responsibility to teach them the truth. Look at Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 through 9. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. The Jewish people actually did that, literally. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So when does it say that I should talk to my kids about the Bible? <laughs> pretty much. I'll list it out here. At home, in the car, at bedtime, in the morning. That pretty much covers my whole life. So yes, all of the times. Look at Proverbs 22, 6. Direct your children onto the right path. And when they're older, they will not leave it. <laughs> Parents, there's a lot of good news in that phrase, when they're older. Okay, I'm just telling you. Cling to that one, right? But you have to direct them, direct them, and then they will not leave it. So what does that mean? If we're going to teach our children constantly, that means we have to be in continual communication with them, right? Continue. Look, you want your children, I want my children, we want them to come to us with questions, right? They have questions. We don't want them running to their buddies or whatever. We want them coming to us, all right? Coming to God, obviously, but coming to us. And, and so they, they need a relationship with us. It's not just like, well, I'm your authority and you're going to do what I say. I mean, you, you can go that route, but that doesn't teach them. That's not a teacher mentality, okay? It might be true, but it doesn't teach them anything, okay? We, we need communication about everything, about their friends, right? About, about what they're hoping for and dreaming for in their life. Man, I love hearing from, that, from them on that, about school, about activities, about interactions with the opposite sex, about issues they're struggling with. They need to communicate with us about failures, about God and prayer and church and the word of God and, and just about things like insecurities and fears in their life. We want them talking to us about these things. And so we have to keep these lines open. Um, something that Kamani and I picked up from, we learned it from Pastor Rick and Michelle, is something we call highs and lows with our family. And we don't get to do this as much as we used to. But uh, when we're together, let's say we're eating dinner together at the table and 
Sometimes we'll do these highs and lows. We'll go around the table and we'll make everybody say, hey, what was a high for you today? Like, what was something good that happened? Or in the week. And then we'll ask them, well, what's, everybody will share something that was low, like a low point, like something bad. And uh, typically we praise God for the highs and, and a lot of times we'll, we'll pray right there for, for those lows, you know, to, to God to help them in that. So just something we've learned to help us keep communication open. Third principle, write this one down. This is a big one. You gotta love them deeply. Love your children deeply. And uh, a few ways I just wanted to point out that you can do that in their lives. And one of them is this, attention. Give that to them. Give them your attention. Because with children, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Y'all know that spells, right? (laughs) We got some graduates in here. I think we know. (laughs) Let's say it this way. And this is a challenge, guys. I know it. Be in the moment. Actually being present in the moment. And I say it's a challenge because... Man, our attention span is getting shorter. Did you know that? I, I like what Michael Hogue, he preached earlier this year, and he pointed this out, that there was a study that shows that our attention span is dropping every passing year. Like in the year 2000, the average person's attention span was 12 seconds. And now the average attention span is eight seconds. What's really interesting is that a goldfish, their attention span is nine seconds. That means we're losing to goldfish right now. I mean, it's a sad state of affairs, but we know what's the problem. Listen, our phones are the problem. Our iPads are the problem. You know, I mean, it's all these things that they're distractions. And, you know, video games are a problem. I'm not just talking to the kids either. Got some adults up in here. Kids, (laughs) some of y'all laughing too hard. Kids need quality time. I mean, we got to give them our attention. Why? Because it's the gift of our presence. Just being with them is a gift. I mean, this is, what, this is what they need. Laugh. Man, have fun. Some of y'all are just too boring. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Get crazy a little bit. Look, teach them how to have fun. We're Christ followers. We should be full of joy. Look at this, look at this verse, Proverbs 17, 22. A cheerful heart is good medicine. That's what our kids need. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. How, how else can we love them deeply? Uh, by affection. Affection. Now listen, I told y'all this a couple of weeks ago. Growing up in my home, affection was not our thing. We didn't know how to do it, okay? It wasn't modeled very well for me. Uh, But I also told you this, that when I started dating Kamani and I saw how her parents interacted with each other, let's just say it opened my eyes. Um, And the way they interacted with their children. And I, I have since learned, I've realized that affection in a family is very important to the health of that family. In fact, the Bible says this in Romans 12, 10. It says that we should love each other with genuine affection. And I'm gonna say this, I'm proud of our family. I'm proud of us. Because even though this is not something that came natural to me, look, we have shifted the culture in our home. We hug each other now. Uh, we tell each other we love, love the other person when they leave the house. Man, so if you're here and you were like me, and maybe you didn't grow up around a lot of affection, can I just tell you, you can change. You can change. It takes work, but you can do it with the Lord's help. Amen? Another way that we love our kids, affirmation. Oh, my goodness, your kids need to hear affirmation and encouragement from you as a parent. So affirm them. Encourage your kids. Let me, let me show you in the Bible where our Heavenly Father did that for Jesus. Look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. You're going to see this is the pattern that our Heavenly Father has set for parents. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven, time out right there. This is like, the, I think, the only place in Scripture where you see All three of the Trinity manifested at the same time in our time and space, right? You see the Son, Jesus, being baptized. You see the Holy Spirit there in the form of a dove. And then the Father is speaking to his Son. This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Get that in your life, man. Think about that. You know what we should be? Be like our Heavenly Father is. 
Speak life to your children. Speak life into them. Like, you can do this. Maybe they're struggling with something. You can do this. I know you can. These kinds of words of encouragement. Now, look, I know we don't want to raise children who are a bunch of entitled jerks. All right? No, there's enough of that in the world. But here's what we do want. We do want self-confident young men and women who feel like they're loved unconditionally and they feel affirmed in their life. And that starts a lot at home. That starts with parenting. Amen? All right, fourth one. I'm going to spend some time on this one. (laughs) Discipline them consistently. Discipline them. Now, I think we need to spend a lot of time on this one. This is not my favorite. In fact, this is my least favorite one. But But I think it's very important. Discipline. Look, it is very important, parents, that you discipline your children. Um, there are several ways to discipline. You know, some spank. I know some people don't. Some do timeouts. How many of y'all remember being grounded? Yes, yeah, some of y'all lived in that state. That's right. Yeah, you just stay there. But di- you need to discipline your children. And here's why. Otherwise, look, if you don't, they're going to be spoiled rotten. And they're going to be, I'm just telling you the truth. They're they're going to be entitled and they're going to be rebellious and defiant. And here's the thing. The worst part is, here's the bad part. It's not that they're going to be rebellious and spoiled children. The problem is they're going to grow up and be spoiled and rebellious adults. And here's 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 the result of that. Their life is going to be extremely difficult. So think about it as a, as a parent. We want to prepare them. It's a lot easier if they learn some of these lessons in your home than if they have to wait until they're adults and learn these lessons. Look at Proverbs 23, 13 and 14. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. <laughs> they might think they are. <laughs> punish them with the rod and save them from death. Listen to that. It's very interesting. By the way, I don't believe anyone else should discipline your child. I just feel like, you know, that's on you. <laughs> you can't, you can't uh, sublet that one out or subcontract that. Um, <laughs> also, discipline is an eternal issue. Did you know that? An eternal issue. Because if a child cannot learn to submit to their parents, they're going to have a hard time submitting to God's will in their life. And so really, discipline, while they're in your home, you know, part of godly discipline and correction is just teaching them to submit their will to God's. Look at this verse, Proverbs 19, 18. Discipline your children while there is hope, otherwise you will ruin their lives. That's basically what I'm saying. All right, note this, write this down. Godly discipline, it trains the heart. That's what it's about, it's the heart. What I mean is when we talk about discipline, a lot of us jump to behavior modification in our minds, really. Well, I don't want to do that anymore. Stop being, stop being that way. Okay, you know, godly discipline is not really about behavior modification. Jesus said everything that you do and say, it starts in the heart. Everything that's going on in your life, it flows from the heart. And uh, it's a heart issue. Look at Mark chapter 7, verse 20 through 23. Jesus said this, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, Adultery, it's interesting, we think of most of these as behaviors, but he's saying, no, this starts in the heart. Coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So yes, should we care about our kids' behavior? Absolutely, but we really need to, be, we really need to watch out for and care even more for their hearts, like what's going on in their heart. What we want to do is we don't want to just train young men and women who know how to say the right things and do the right things. No, we want to train young men and women who can recognize when their hearts are af- like off track from God's heart. Like, okay, this isn't lining up. Do y'all see what I'm saying? And, uh, and there's a couple of ways that you can do that. I think they're in your notes, or if not, please write this down. Two ways to train their hearts. It's the same things that we do with ourselves as Christ followers. Number one, ask heart-revealing questions to your kids. Again, I'm no expert at this, but what it means is you have to listen to them. You ask them questions that are gonna help them figure out why. You're trying to get them to understand the motives behind their behavior. 
Does that make sense? Like, like they're asking, okay, why am I behaving this way? What, is there something in me that, that my heart is not lining up with God's? Like, okay, maybe, am I being selfish in an area? <laughs> Big revelation, right? That's why I'm acting the way I'm acting. Am I being, am I fearful? Man, that's a big one. Much of our human behavior comes out of fear. Am I being fearful? Well, man, that's why I always jack my brother in the eye. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm, I'm afraid he's going to take something from me. Am I, am, I, am I prideful? Is that what's going on in my heart? See, all these things, these things that are contrary to God, they hide themselves in our heart, but they always come out in our behavior. And this is what we're trying to teach our children. You're, you're like, man, that sounds like something that I do for myself. It is. You have to parent yourself first. <laughs> That's exactly right. Can I get an amen on that? Some of y'all need a better amen. All right. The other thing we do is we, we don't only ask them heart-revealing questions. Then we share heart-revealing truths to them. That's the word of God. Like, here's what the word says. Just simple truths. And that way they're learning how to consider whether, whether their thoughts, their attitudes line up with God's. Do y'all understand that? A few more points about discipline. Godly discipline, it has to be clear. Look, it has to be clear. We cannot be vague parents. Oh my goodness, I've fallen in this area too. It can't be like, well, I'm, I'm disciplining you. You're, you're getting punished because, look, you know what? You're getting a whipping because you're annoying. I mean, it cannot be that, right? That's not clarity. They need to understand. Kids need to know that they're being disciplined for disobedience and for rebellion. You know, I told you to do something, you didn't do it. I mean, it's gotta be clarity, right? Um, it can't be just because they're a kid. Can I get some consensus here? Kids do dumb things. I mean, and that's not, and we don't discipline them because they're kids, okay? Uh, with that, I gotta give you another story. Um, kids are great for that, stories. Listen, Jonathan, who's right here on the front row, yes, he loves that I'm talking about him right now. He's 12 years old. But uh, when he was around, I don't know, four years old, I think it was, and uh, again, I have to ask Kamani about these, these dates and ages. They elude me. But uh, he was about four years old in our house. We weren't there. Somebody was supposedly watching them. It wasn't Bailey. Let me make it clear, okay? It's someone who's no longer in our church. And uh, anyway... Somehow he got out. I mean, because he's, he's like that. I mean, he's a, an escape artist. And he's so strong-willed, all of my kids are. He just decided, I'm going to my friend's house. So I'm just going to walk there. Okay, so I'm getting out of the house. That's what he does. He ends up at the auto parts store. Because remember, he's four, you know what I'm saying? But he was confident. He knew where he was going. The lady at the auto parts store sees him come into the store. And she's like, what, can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to buy some spark plugs. No, he didn't, he didn't do that. She gives him, somehow he, he finagles a Coke and a, and a snack out of her. And she, she calls the, uh, the, the police wisely. They show up and they talk to him. Hey, do you know where you live? Yeah, I know where I live. I don't need your help. Oh, we just want to follow you home. We, we want to we follow you back to your house. This is literally what he tells the police officers. They told me this later. He said, no, you don't have to follow me. I'm telling you, I know, I know where I live. Y'all can go about your jobs. I'm going home. <laughs> Well, clearly they didn't listen to him wisely. They, they did follow him home, and that was a fun conversation at the house. But uh, anyway, y'all get what I'm saying. I mean, discipline has to be clear. <laughs> Kids do dumb things, all right? All right, write this down as well. Godly discipline is compassionate as well. Compassionate. And uh, I think it is wise. Please, let me coach you on this. Out of my own failures. It is very wise to never discipline when you're angry. It never accomplishes the purpose. That, that's not what discipline is about, okay? And again, when I was younger, I failed in this area. And uh, you've got to calm down. If you're a person with a temper in here, and that is your weakness, and you can't control yourself, here's, this is my opinion to you, all right? Ready? If you cannot get this right, what I'm talking about, then you need to choose an alternate form of discipline. Seriously, like timeouts, groundings, whatever. If you can't control your temper when you're disciplining, okay? And I'm just telling you because nothing good ever comes out of it. Uh, but here's a good idea. Here's a good idea. Have them repeat back why they were disciplined. You know, afterwards, like, it's because you told me to clean my room and I didn't do it. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be, it goes back to that idea of clarity. But also, here's some things I learned from a friend of mine. After that, you can, you can say a, 
You can say a short prayer over them. Not like, Lord, don't let me kill them. Not that prayer. I mean, like after, after, uh, after you discipline them, you can just pray over them. And, and then the rest of the day, be extra nice to them. Again, I learned this from a friend of mine. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's for a couple of reasons. So that they know that you forgive them, but also so they know that discipline is not a bad thing. It's, it's not like they're being rejected. They're being accepted as a son or a daughter, right? God disciplines those who he what? Loves, that's right. And so do we. And they need to understand that, that you still love them. It's good. Amen? Last one is this. Write this down. Godly discipline is convicting. Convicting versus condemning. Right? We talk a lot about this, the difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit versus condemnation, which is from the enemy. And uh, Ephesians 6, 4, look, it says this. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. That would be condemnation is what that is. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. See, conviction is always specific instruction. You said this to your sister. You hurt her. It was wrong. That's the Holy Spirit. Okay? Pointing things like that out. And that's how you know it's from the Holy Spirit. But condemnation is general, man. And, 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 and please don't get this way with your children. Condemnation is like this. You're so bad. You, you're just so jacked up. You're never going to accomplish anything in life. You, you're, you are, you are, you are, you're a bad person. You're evil. Man, listen to me. That's how the devil, that's, that's how he does it with you. Certainly you don't need to be playing the devil's role in your child's life. Never tell your kids things like that, like, you're bad, these blanket general statements. Why? Because what you'll be doing is shaping their identity. You'll be shaping their future with your words. And uh, now, it's not like if you've messed up in that area, it's not like you can't turn that around. You can go back, God's got mercy, amen? And you can, and you can start today changing that right now. And you can call a family meeting and you can say, look, I'm sorry. In fact, it would be really good for them to see you as a parent saying that to them. We're not doing this in my house anymore. Conviction is this. What you did was wrong. Not your evil. And we correct our kids because correction points to their future and it's necessary and it's biblical, right? It's a, it's a direction in their life. And this is just a side thing I thought of. Please, please never shame your kids or discipline them in public. I'm telling you, look, you can just whisper in their ear if they're acting out. Maybe you're at the house. You just say, hey, you need to go to your room right now. It'd be very good for you to do that. Or whatever. Maybe if you're out somewhere, you just need to whisper in their ear, you know, say, hey, listen, hey, 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 hey. When we get home, I'm going to apply the board of education to your seat of learning. Or whatever. You might want to say, you smell when I'm cooking? I mean, you know what I'm saying. Like, just like that kind of thing. Okay. Y'all get it. Just don't do it in public. Um, I want to share something that has brought Kamani and I a lot of peace in our lives as parents. Because listen, we're like you guys. I think, man, I started off talking about this, that sometimes we feel like we've done a good job and then at other times we have missed the mark as parents. And uh, I want to go back to what we talked about in Psalm 127, the passage we started with. Remember what the sign, the sign of walking with God is what? It's rest. If you're walking with God, he says you have sleep. Look at it. For he grants sleep to those he loves. And when it comes to raising your kids, please remember that. You're like, well, if I'm sleeping on the job, man, if I'm resting, then who's, who's guarding the city? Who's watching out for my kids? Y'all look at me, ready? God is. God is. What I'm saying is you do what you can. But you then have to trust God with the rest. You have got to trust God, okay? You got to leave it to him. The Bible says this. I want you to think about this. The Bible says that while you were still his enemy, God saved you. Don't you think that now that you are his friend, he is going to help you raise your kids to love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength? I'm telling you, he will. But it all comes down to what? Trusting him. It's hard to trust God when it comes to your children. But some of you, man, that's what you have got to do today. You've got to trust him. Because why? Because his love never fails and his grace, his grace never runs out. It never runs out. Amen? 
Can I pray for you? Can you bow your heads, close your eyes? Gosh, God, you're so good to us. And Lord, I know that none of us, none of us in this room, look, we're, you are not obligated to us at all, God. And nowhere do I see that in scripture. You could treat us however you wanted to and you would be justified because you're God and I'm not. But you gave us so much grace. You sent Jesus because you knew we needed forgiveness in order to be right with you. Lord, I thank you for that. Let me just pause here. If anyone is in here and you would say, we've been talking about grace and we've been talking about mercy and you would say, I don't know, I don't have that. I need Jesus in my life. I need him to forgive me. More than that though, you would say, I need him to be the Lord of my life. Like he calls the shots. Some of you may have even called on him as savior, but you, you still don't have him as your Lord. You can get that right right now. Maybe you've veered from him in your life like you used to know him, but now your life looks nothing like the plan he has for you, and you know it, and you want to recommit your walk to God. No one else looking around. Listen, you can make this declaration and invite the Lord to be the Lord of your life anywhere, but right now I want you to do heavenly business. If that's you, lift your hand up toward heaven right now. I want to know who I'm praying for. And if that's you, could you look up at me? I want, I want to see you. Yes, I see you right there. Anybody else? Yes, right there. Yes, right there. Yeah, another person over there in the back. Yep. Yeah, I see you over there in the corner. Hey, you could put your hands down if that was you. Pray something like this from your heart if that was you. Father God, I'm sorry. I am sorry. I've been doing life the way I think is best, and that is wrong. I see that now. I need you, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, and you rose from the grave so I could have a brand new life. So I need that now. Forgive me. But not just that. You're the Lord now. What you say goes in my life. Here, have permission. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Look into all the areas and direct me and guide me. And Lord, I pray you'd not only fill me with your Holy Spirit, get me connected to your body, the church, so I can continually grow in you the rest of my life. Amen. 